I was hurting all alone. I was searching for a comfort I could find on my own with no direction. Feeling down, my life was headed for disaster. Do you turn me around? Nothing ever had been able to ease me when trying to please me. It only Did I tell you about the lady who took her husband to the doctor? He was ailing, he was sick, and he was just lethargic, no energy. She took him to the doctor. The doctor took him in for a consultation, examined him, and so forth. And then after the examination, the doctor called his wife in while the husband went out and sat in the car. And the doctor said to his wife, your husband is a sick man. But if you take care of him, he will live. Don't let him do nothing. Put him in the bed, total bed rest. You do everything for him. You bathe him, you clip his nails, you feed him, you comb his hair, you shave him, everything. Total bed rest, he'll live. So the wife came out, sat in the car, the husband was in the car, and the husband said, what did the doctor say? Oh, she was mean. You know what she said? You're going to die. That's what she said. I got a message for you. You are going to die too. You are going to die. Get your Bibles and let's talk about this. We need to talk about this. We're in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse number 6. We've been dealing with the topic of peace in the valley. Peace in the valley. We're talking about that subject of death that no one wants to talk about. Well, we got to talk about it today. No one wants to talk about it. It's a taboo subject. We don't talk about our own death. And death is one of those topics that you just don't want to talk about. But we got to talk about it today. Get your Bibles. Again, we're in 2 Peter chapter number, 2 Timothy rather, chapter number 4, beginning with verse number 6. Paul said this. Paul was in prison in Rome. He was on, on death row. He said these words, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I finish my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is later for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, not only to me, but unto all them that love his appearing. One of the keys to success is called preparation. You're going to be successful in anything in every field or any field. There has to be some preparation. If you're going to be a doctor. There has to be at least four years. I said four years of preparation. You want to be a lawyer? Four years. Lawsuit school. In order to be a successful lawyer. And many other careers. There has to be preparation. If you are going to be successful in anything, there has to be proper preparation. Oh, yes. And I bet you right now, you are preparing for something. You are getting ready for something. Some of you I'm talking to right now may be preparing for marriage. You want to get married, the day is set, and you are preparing. You're getting ready for it. I may be talking to someone who's getting ready for college. You're making preparations for college. And on and on and on. I don't know what you're getting ready for, but I know that every one of us are getting ready for something. At all times, we are getting ready. 
But I need to place this on your mind, that you need to be ready for many things in life. Ready for your career. Ready for your marriage. Ready to raise a family. Be ready. But you need to be, and I need to be, we need to be ready for death. Death. Be ready. Well, death is a harsh word, and we don't really like to say death. We like to dress the word up. We don't like to say death. Have you ever noticed that uh, in the funeral home, in the mortician business, they don't normally say death. They say deceased. That sounds a little bit better. They say passed away. That sounds a little bit better. And we like to dress it up. And sometimes we use the word transition. He or she has transition. That's a beautiful word. That's a beautiful word for death. That's what we got to talk about today. It may be a beautiful word, uh, but we got to talk about it today. We're talking about this. So Paul says, I am now ready to be offered. Look at that adverb of time. Now, he says, I am now ready to be offered. I am now ready to be offered. I'm so glad that Paul said that because there are many people that are not ready. Uh, there are many people who used to be ready. Oh, they used to be members of the church. They used to be active in the church. They used to be faithful to the Lord. They, they used to be ready. Now they are not ready. Matter of fact, they've fallen away from the faith. Peter said these words about someone who has fallen away from the faith. He says, they are like uh, dogs who have vomited and going back to their vomit. What a nauseating subject. And it's like a cow or a hog, rather, who has been washed, he been in the mud and in the dirt, and he's been washed up, and as soon as he's washed up, if you don't wash him, he'll go right back to the mud. That's how Peter describes a backslidden Christian. And so there are individuals who used to be ready. And then there are those individuals who will be ready. Or they pride themselves on the fact that I, I, I will be ready. I, I'm going to be ready. I, I'm getting ready. And they have plans. They have glorious plans of being ready. They plan to come back to the church. They plan to give their life to Christ. They plan to, to even serve in the church. And they plan and they have all of these glorious plans to be faithful. I will be ready. And did I tell you about the man who uh, said to the preacher, I'm coming back to church. I I'm coming back to church and I'm coming back and I'm going to be faithful to the Lord. And the preacher kept asking him uh, about his status with the Lord. And he kept saying, I I'm coming back, I'm coming back, I'm coming back. And true to his word, he came back. But he came back in a hearse, a black suit, and in the casket. Oh, he came back. And did I tell you about the man, and you know about the man in the Bible who, who had all of these glorious plans. Do you know him? His crop had brought forth plentiful, the Bible says. He had crops. He had uh, all of these crops, and he had nowhere to store the crops. And he said, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to tear down these old barns. I'm going to build some new barns. And there I'm going to store my goods. Now I'm going to say to my soul, so take your ease. Eat, drink, and be merry. God heard him and God said, thy fool. 
This night you're going to die. And yes, he died. Oh, he had great plans. He had great plans. The only problem with future plans is that sometimes you do not live to visualize or experience the plans. Used to be ready. Will be ready. Those are foolish plans. The only logical and the only sensible situation is to be ready. Be ready right now. And that's what Paul says. I am now ready. I need to ask you this. I need to ask you this. Are you ready right now? Are you ready right now? Well, I need to ask Paul, and we need to ask Paul, uh, Paul, how did you get ready? We need to ask Paul that. Paul, the Apostle Paul, yes, look at him now. He's in a prison cell in Rome. He's on death row. But Paul said, I'm ready. I'm ready, and I need to ask Paul, and we need to ask Paul, Paul, how did you get ready? He says these words, I am now ready to be offered and the time of my departure is at hand. First of all, he gives three things that he did to get ready. Three preparations. He says, first of all, he says, I have fought a good fight. I have fought a good fight. That's how Paul got ready. He had fought a good fight. A good fight is when you do your best. Have you ever fought a good fight? Have you ever been in a fight and you just gave it all that you had? You gave your best. That's a good fight. And that's what Paul is saying. I have fought a good fight. But I need to ask Paul. Who did you fight, Paul? Who, who have you fought, Paul? And Paul would say these words concerning his fight. Put on the whole armor of God. Ephesians chapter 6. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to fight against the wiles of the devil, the trickery of the devil. The schemes of the devil. Don't you know the devil got some wild? Don't you know the devil got some tricks up his sleeve? And Paul said, I had to put on the whole armor of God in order to fight against the wiles of the devil, against his tricks. And I, brothers and sisters, the devil got some tricks. He got some tricks up his sleeve and he will trick you and he will deceive you. But Paul says, I have put on the whole armor of God. The metaphor that he's using is the ancient soldier uh, that would put on the armor, uh, the helmet and the breastplate and the girdle around the waist and the feet and, uh, and all of this and the shoes. He said, I put on the whole armor of God that I might be able to fight against the wiles of the devil. Well, can I give you the description of the devil just in case you meet him? <laughs> can, I, can I give you a description of the devil just in case you meet him? You might meet him one day. The Bible says in this passage of scripture in Ephesians chapter 6, calls him a ruler. He's a ruler. The man is a ruler. And the Bible also says he's the God of this world. The boy got power. I said the boy got power. He's the ruler of this world. He's the God of this world. And the devil got power. You better be careful. He'll overpower you. And not only that, what makes him so dangerous is that he's invisible. You can't see him. The devil is invisible. And the reason why so many Christians don't really believe in a literal devil or literal Satan is because he is invisible. And the Bible says, and Paul says in Ephesians chapter 6, 
uh, spiritual, I'm fighting against spiritual wickedness in high places. The devil is invisible. I read uh, a study that was done, a poll that was done, and it said that 46% of evangelical Christians don't believe in a literal Satan or real, real devil. 46%. And that's the way the devil wants it. He doesn't want you to believe in him. But Paul says, I put on the whole arm of God that I might be able to fight against the wiles of the devil. I want to tell you something. You don't know how to fight with the devil. He will beat you up and beat you down and beat you all around. If you don't know how to fight. If you don't have the whole armor of God the way Paul did, he will beat you up and beat you down and beat you all around. And I, I'm looking at somebody right now who's who been beat up by the devil. You've been beat up and beat down because you just don't know how to fight the devil. You don't know how to fight the devil. Paul will give you some tips and give us some tips as to how to defeat the devil and how to fight against the devil. He says, put on the girdle of truth. The girdle of truth. If you fight against the devil and if you're going to be victorious over the devil, you got to work within the realm of truth. Because the devil is all about lies. He's all about deception. And if you enter to that territory, if you are lying and deceptive, you are working and you are uh, fighting on his territory, on his turf. He's all about deception and all about lies. So don't you join that. You can't, you can't beat the devil with a lie because he, that's his territory. And Jesus called him a liar and the father of lies in John chapter 8. The devil is the world's greatest liar. He's the world's greatest deceptor, and he will fool you. He will deceive you. That's his MO. And so Paul says, you got to be able to tell the truth. And can I just ask you to do that? Oh, sometimes it's hard to tell the truth. Can you raise your hand? Can you testify? Sometimes it's hard, it's difficult to tell the truth. But oh, if you're going to beat the devil, you've got to be able to tell the truth. And then Paul says, in order to fight with the devil, you've got to have the breastplate of righteousness. You've got to be living a righteous life in order to fight with the devil. You can live a sinful life, a raggedy life, and fight with the devil. He will beat you up and beat you down because that's what he's all about. He's all about sin. You can't live in sin and be successful against the devil. You are fighting on his territory. You are fighting on his turf. You got to be righteous. And Paul says you got to have the breast, breastplate of righteousness in order to fight with the devil. You can't live in sin and fight Satan. You can't be a devil and fight the devil. Let me say that again. You can't be a devil and fight the devil. And something else Paul says. You got to have your feet shod with the gospel of peace simply means this you got to fight the devil with peaceful relationship being at peace with others and the bible says throughout the bible it talks about being a peaceful person be at peace among yourself paul told the ephesian brothering told the brothers at rome Live peaceably with all men. You see, the reason why Paul said that and the reason why we must be at peace is because the devil loves confusion. He loves cussing and fussing and fighting. He loves, that's his territory. I will tell you this. I will tell you this. Where there is fussing and fighting and commotion and all of that, the devil is living among you. That's his territory. 
And so if you're going to fight him, you must be a peaceful person. You must love peace. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, those who love peace and those who would generate peace. That's what Jesus says. And yes, if you want to successfully fight with the devil, Paul says, you got to have a shield of faith. The shield of faith. Faith. In other words, you must believe in God. You must have faith in God. You must have trust in God because you cannot fight the devil by yourself. You need the help of God. Let me say it again. You can't fight the devil by yourself. The devil is too strong for you. So you must, we must summon the help of God and we summon the help of God by trusting in him that he will aid us and help us fight against the wiles of the devil. And finally, Paul says, you got to have the helmet of salvation. The assurance that you are going to be. Are you sure that you're going to be saved? I say, are you sure? Are you positive that you are going to be saved after you exit this life? It's called the helmet of salvation or the hope of salvation. Then he finally says, the sword of the spirit. That's the only offensive weapon we have. The sword, which is the word of God. The reason why the devil beats us up and beats us down and defeats us because many people do not know the word of God. You do not know the word of God. And if you do not know the word of God, the devil will beat you every time. Jesus, in his confrontation with the devil in Matthew chapter four, he used the word of God. Every time the devil came to him with a temptation, Jesus said, it is written, it is written, it is written. He knew the word of God and the devil could not deceive him. The devil could not trick him. And the reason why the devil is tricking many of us is because we do not know the word of God. Oh, yes. And then Paul says, <clears throat> I have finished my course. I have finished my race. The Christian life is likened unto a race. And Paul says, the reason I'm ready, the reason I'm ready to die is because I have finished my race. I finished my race. He went on to say this to the Corinthian church. He says, 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 24, don't you realize that in a race, everyone runs, but only one person get the prize. So run to win, he says. Verse 25, all athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away but we do it for an eternal prize. I want you to look at a word that he uses here. He says, while we are running this Christian race, it's just like a runner in the Olympic, ancient Olympic race, they had to discipline themselves. He uses that word twice, discipline, discipline. Can I tell you what discipline is? Discipline is painful training and prohibition. In other words, if an athlete is going to be successful, there must be some train, some painful training. If you don't hurt, you're not doing nothing in your training. Let me say it again. You training, if it doesn't hurt, you ain't doing nothing. Pardon my French. You ain't doing nothing if you are not hurting. If your muscles are not hurting, you are not hurting. You are not really training. Okay? So he uses that word discipline. And Paul goes on to say, I discipline my body. He looks at himself as a runner. He says, I discipline my body. I punish my body. I punish my body. I want to tell you something, my brothers and sisters, about discipline and training. You come to a place 
when you don't want to train. Yes, I, I said it. Let me say it again. If you are an athlete, if you are doing anything and you are training, there's going to come a time when you just don't want to train. You just don't want to get out of the bed. You just don't want to train. You, you just don't want to train. You just don't want to discipline your body. There will come a time when you just don't want to come to church. You just don't want to read the Bible. You just don't want to do what it takes to be a Christian. You will come to that point. You just don't want. And Paul says, I have to discipline myself. I say, brothers and sisters, we have to discipline ourselves. We have to discipline our tongue. There are some things that you can't say. There are some things that you can't say. So you got to discipline your tongue. You got to, you got to, you got to put a chain on your tongue. You got to discipline your eyes. There are some things you ought not see. You got to discipline your feet. There are some places you ought not be going. Discipline. You got to discipline your mind. And there are some things you ought not be thinking. And the Christian life is all about discipline. Discipline your life. Controlling yourself. And Paul says, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. Oh, yes, the good fight of faith. And then Paul says these words. He concludes, I have kept the faith. I have kept the faith. That's number three. Paul says, the reason I'm ready to die, the reason I'm ready to be, uh, to be offered and depart, I have kept kept the faith. Well, looking back at the Olympic Games again, if you were running or uh, competing in any particular game, they were, there were rules and regulations. And any runner or any participant had to abide by the rules and the regulation in order to qualify, in order to win the race. If you do not follow the rules, you will be disqualified. Qualified, And that's what Paul was talking to the Corinthians about. He says, I, I run and I don't want to be disqualified. Can I whisper this? There are some members of the church, when they get to heaven, they're going to be disqualified. Because they have not kept the rules of the game of Christianity. And so Paul says again, uh, I have kept the faith, which simply means I have kept God's commandments. I, I have kept the rules. I have kept the law of God. I have kept the word. That's what he is saying. Well, let, let me tell you this. There is no substitute for keeping the word of God. There is no substitute for obeying the word of God. Nothing else will substitute for it. Giving, you can give to the Lord and all of that, but you can't substitute giving for obeying the truth and obeying God. Oh, yes, you can come to church and you should come to church, but church attendance uh, cannot substitute for obeying the law. You can't bribe the Lord by coming to church. You can't bribe the Lord by giving him on the first day of the week. God is not going to turn his head because you give generously in the contribution. No, he will not. There is no substitution. King Saul tried to do that. Oh, do you remember King Saul? You ought to read 1 Samuel chapter 15. He was the king of Israel, and he was going up against the Amalekites, a fierce army. God told him to do this. God says, when you go down to the Amalekites, I want you to destroy everything and don't bring back nothing. Destroy everything. Well, Saul came back and he brought the best of the sheep and the best of the animals and brought Agag the king back. He came back and he pretended that he had obeyed the law. Samuel confronted him. The Bible says, and Samuel said, Had the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings? 
and sacrifices. Now, Paul, and now Samuel said, the reason I have brought these animals back, I'm going to do sacrifices. I'm going to offer these animals as a sacrifice to the Lord. Oh, yes, the Lord told me to destroy all the animals, but I'm bringing them back to make sacrifice. I'm bringing them back to sacrifice them unto the Lord. And this is what Samuel said. As in obeying the voice, Lord, does the Lord have great delight in burnt offering and sacrifice? As in obeying the voice of the Lord, behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. Did you hear that? To obey is better than sacrifice. You can't substitute anything for obedience. No sacrifice, no giving, no service, no nothing. We must obey the Lord. And then Paul finally concludes with this. Second Timothy chapter four and verse number eight. Henceforth, there is later for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give to me in that day, and not only me, but to all those who love his appearing. Oh, Paul is ready now. He said, I'm ready to depart. Got my bags packed. I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I've kept the faith. And I'm ready. Last question, final question. Are you ready? Are you ready? Did you do what Paul did to get ready? I suggest that you not only get ready, you need to be ready and stay ready. This is Brother James Gray, the minister of the Eastside Church of Christ. We love you and may God richly bless you on today.